but I welcome everybody. Uh, this is the second panel discussion in Novak 2013. It's going to be very exciting because you have a, a selection of very experienced people uh, to address a bugbear of mine personally as an artist and a former journalist's help in this region. Um, I've called it um, what you see up there. Censorship versus conformity, conformity, the double-edged sword of the creator from the Middle East. Um, just to give you an idea of what um, I meant by that, um, I'm just going to read to you what I sent to the panelists, and then we're going to start the discussion. Um, but first, let me introduce the panel to you. We have here with us Dr. Alanud al Sharikh. She is a gender politics uh, specialist. She also specializes in cultural politics and politics of kinship. Um, and she is at the moment at SOAS University in London. We are also joined by Rose Issa, who doesn't need much introduction in this region. Rose has been championing the art of the region for the past 30 years. Uh, for as, as far as I know as an artist, she was the first person who ever came to see our works and actually give any value to it. She is also a producer, a writer, and she is um, an advisor to important museums in the West and in the region in acquisition of art. Um, we also have, um, you have to pronounce your name for me, Manal. Manal al Dawayan. Manal al Dawayan, who, is, uh, who used to be um, in the corporate world, but is now a practicing artist from Saudi Arabia. And we saw some of her work at CAP last night. So if you haven't been to see that exhibition, I strongly recommend it, that you should go and see. She's got some uh, very interesting work up on the wall. Our last panelist, but not least, is George Azar. That if you were lucky enough to catch his presentation yesterday, you would have been also very moved by a film uh, called uh, Palestine Photographer. George has been um, f covering the region's conflict and news extensively, is the author of Palestine, a photographic journey, as well as making many films now for Al Jazeera. Um, we may also draw on Dr. Sharur Amin, who is an artist, and uh, she will probably help us. And uh, we have a lot of people who can actually help us in this discussion. And the discussion is this, how do we negotiate as artists from this region and journalists? Personally, I've had um, this problem of censorship at home. How can we express ourselves freely in a region where, apart from official censorship, we also face a lot of cultural um, questions that we have to address? In, and this brings on self-regulation, other than the official um, censorship. And on the other hand, how do we negotiate with the West in the output, in our creative work or our journalistic work? Because often it's the case that what we want them to see, they may not want to see the way that we wish to show it. And I'm going to start with Manal. <laughs> as a practicing artist, is that okay <laughs> for you to yes. start? I wondered, um, have you found, for example, in Saudi, what are your personal experiences in trying to do the work that you want to do? How do you moderate yourself? And how then do you see the reaction in the West to your work? Um, how do you stop yourself from being exotified by the West? A lot of questions. There's two questions question. that are very, very, very wide. I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> let's start off. Uh, I think the most significant, uh, usually this question of censorship is the most common question I get asked as an artist coming from Saudi Arabia. This is a curiosity. And everybody's always looking for an amazing story of, were you censored? And how were you tortured? Were you? And to tell you the truth, I've never been censored. And I always look for the censorship because usually when an artist is censored, they immediately become a star. <laughs> <laughs> this has not happened to me. Actually, all my artworks have been published in um, Saudi newspapers, 
uh, all my projects are conducted within Saudi Arabia and within the Saudi community. The subjects I address are extremely يعني, close to what's happening socially within my community. But it doesn't mean that there are challenges of censorship within uh, an artist's mind and within yourself. And I always say that um, I have, uh, in Arabic, we call them Banat Afkari, which is the girls of my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And these are a huge gang that have very long conversations about the different elements that I put into my work and the subject. And the biggest struggles is, are, and the biggest struggles for me were usually, uh, Am I, am I making the work for the audience or, I, or am I producing it as an expression of what I feel? And this is something that you play with. And then you go into the whole other realm of uh, what audience am I addressing? Is it my Saudi local community, my mother, my aunts who uh, do not go to museums often or art fairs? Or am I trying to go to the intellectual outsider uh, who's exposed to art continuously. And these are the different realms of censorship. But a small story, I worked on a project uh, about two years ago about um, women's uh, permission to travel in Saudi Arabia. And it uh, formulated into a, a large installation of doves. It was a participatory art project, so a lot of women donated their uh, permission to travel slips and I placed it on the artwork. Uh, it was shown in Dubai the first time, and uh, the sponsors of our show, people who paid for the production of the booklet, refused to put my doves uh, as they were. It's because they carry um, logos from the Ministry of Interior, and they were very worried, so they themselves took it upon them. So they pr produced the catalog with the dove naked. In my eyes, it was naked. It was just white. Mm. One week later, the same dove and the installation got a four-page spread in Ahlan wa Sahlan, which is a magazine that you find in flight magazine in Saudi Arabian Airlines. So every Saudi of every uh, level of society travels, because it's our single uh, airline, got to see this uh, artwork within that newspaper. And it makes you wonder why people take it upon themselves to you know, say, no, 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 this is so inappropriate. So they gave a kind of a sanctity to a, a stamp, an official stamp. But they in were fact, scared. They, they, were they also made it naked, as you say, which is uh, the sort of ironic byproduct of censorship sometimes. Interesting. And Rose, how, how do your artists over the years um, that, I mean, I asked you this question yesterday as well, and how do they negotiate? Uh. You know, a real artist always finds a loophole. If we're co uh, quoting today uh, classics like Shakespeare, Rumi, Hafez, they always had all the poets in the Arab world, Iran, uh, in the West actually, in England, elsewhere, always said things that are truthful even today that could have gone through censorship but that gives inspiration to many artists. But apart from poets, which are the basic of our, uh, many of the references that we have in the region, uh, I want also to quote a, a film, but because you're so young, probably none of you has seen a film in 1949, <laughs> uh, uh, which is called The Third Man. In The Third Man is a by a wonderful artist called Orson Welles. There is a quote, and uh, if you Google, uh, you can download the film. It says, in 30 years in Italy, in 30 years under the Borgias, uh, we had Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Renaissance. Uh, and in 500 years of peace and brotherly love and democracy in Switzerland, all they produce is a cuckoo club. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all depends. I think sometimes, I don't want to say you have to be under pressure in order to produce, but the pressure and the angst uh, creates works and the censorship, even things that are censored, inspires artists. These are things that inspire artists. They find the loopholes to express it. And no matter how much they are censored in their time or later or before, uh, they, they manage, if they are good artists, to express it. And in many, many artists that I uh, worked with, I find that every time it's a refreshing way of finding a way of saying it. Mm -hmm. So 
I think if you have something to say, as I said, I don't want to repeat myself, but you can say it. That you'll find a way, because I mean, um, one of the things, uh, the arts of the region, I mean, certainly with Persian, that's the case, that we are so good at seeing things in a roundabout way, and we're so adept at it, that uh, we find codes to say it. But are those codes then understandable by the West? Or do those codes then themselves lead to some kind of exotic um, understanding of the work? Uh, maybe. I don't know. When you, when you think of, of the artists, for example, Leonardo da Vinci or even our poets in Iran and the Arab world, a lot of them, let's say, were homosexual and were complimenting young men. I mean, I don't know if it was censored in their time or not. It is still an issue even today in, in many, many places in, on earth, many, most of the countries. But they managed to express it, and, and everybody associated, whether you're heterosexual, homosexual, asexual, you associated with those verses, with those poetry, mm. because it was simply beautiful. It did ex express a sentiment that people share for love, for beauty, for uh, torture, for angst, for grief. And I think, uh, I don't know if it's an, a question of ex uh, exotic being. I know that, for example, in the West, they expect us very often, uh, bad curators go, oh, this is forbidden in Iran, so I have to show it. I said, no, if the work is good, show it. If the work is not good, we don't care if it's censored. You know, don't show it. Show good works. Because uh, lots of people send me, artists send me and think, oh, I cannot show my work in Iran because I have made a new. No, uh, it, the, your nude has to be better than Lucien Freud before I show it. Do mm. something that is so unusual that I can show. Not because you make a nude and it's forbidden in Iran that I'm going to show you in an exhibition. Yeah. So it's not really about what is forbidden. It's about what is the language, the aesthetic language, the, uh, the concepts that people use that is important, I think, and how you express it. But, uh, yesterday we mentioned Iranian cinema, you know, it was with extreme modesty. There is so much restriction in Iran and uh, uh, so much restriction, not only politically, financially. Most of the directors I know from Kiarostami, Panahi, Robadi, uh, everybody did it with almost nothing, their film. Kiarostami was selling his photographs for $100 and $300. I used to bring everybody from the festival say, bye, bye you know, so that he can make films. So it's not really the financial restriction, the moral, the intellectual, it's just that, do you have the energy, the enthusiasm, the guts to yeah. say what you have to say? And um, f from what I'm hearing, from what you're saying, is that also maybe this um, sense of veiling that we have, and uh, I use the word very carefully, um, it may add to the mystery of the work that uh, it makes it more interesting for the local and the foreign viewers to try and actually uh, make something of it. It makes it more available for interpretation even. But that's something that can't happen with news, George. And um, with art, I think we're more um, at, you know, we have more room for being mysterious. But news by nature isn't supposed to be mysterious. It's supposed to be dealing with reality. And um, from my own experience, one of the things that uh, I found as a parallel in the journalistic world was that if you're writing or you're sending photographs, if um, the Western editor doesn't see the marker, for example, in the one that I always harp on about is the chador for Iran, the black chador, um, or if you're writing something and you're trying to balance it, it may not necessarily make it into print because uh, they're not happy to see that point of view. How do you negotiate it in news? Well, in news, there's, there's a couple prime directives, and, and one is to tell your story simply and to tell it directly and to tell it clearly. Um, so the idea of skirting censorship doesn't really work for us. Another of the, of the guiding principles is speaking truth to power. And as journalists, our job is to, um, is to speak directly to power, to speak directly to censorship, to to be the person that goes that place where the regime might not want you to go or where the party in power doesn't want you to go. It brings up a, di a dilemma, however, if you have any sort of conscience about it at all because to work in a foreign country and to work in film especially is a team effort. It's a collaborative effort. Um, as a journalist, you have both the luxury and the responsibility of being able to go 
places other people can't go or are forbidden to go. Um, and you also have the luxury of leaving when the story is done. And a problem that I have faced again and again is that when I've done the most important stories, I think, the stories that the regime didn't want to get out, um, I was able to leave, but the people that I worked with there, the people that I came into contact with in that country, those were the ones who got into trouble. Recently I did a film in Gaza, which was one of the more successful films that I've done, and it got a million and 100,000 hits on YouTube, which I thought was really great. Well, the thing that wasn't so great is it then came to the attention of the people in power there. And because I wasn't around, because the people, the production house from New York were not around, they went out and they arrested our taxi driver. And he had nothing to do with the content of the film. He had no say in how the film was shaped or in its message, but he was there and he was vulnerable. And he was a pressure point to us. Mm. And so while you have a responsibility to your audience, you also have a responsibility to the people that you come in contact with, and, people yeah. that you interview. And that's very interesting because as an artist, and I'm going to come to Alan Ud because this is your speciality, is uh, what Manal was saying, is uh, this uh, sense of how much you can reveal yourself. As an Iranian woman artist in a country where uh, really up until the revolution there were a handful of artists or writers and now they're flourishing, you have to constantly negotiate about what will your family think? I mean, and forget about the officials. What will your family think? If you, for example, want to write about something of a sexual nature or if you're opposing some of the values of the family. And from what, um, jo and that's what you were saying, that that's something in the mind of the artist, the girls of your ideas, sort of maybe um, talking to each other and thinking how far you can go, will the great aunt mind, etc. And from what George is saying, this also happens in a strange way he is developing kinship with the people that he is leaving behind. So his work um, and his sense of self censorship, or um, in his case, maybe not censorship, is sort of extending itself to other people, a little tribe that's being created for that film or for that project. How do you find that um, um, in your uh, work, this works in this region? How do we negotiate? Well, I think the, the recurring theme seems to be tied into um, the way we see ourselves in our communities. We try to express ourselves artistically as individuals, but we then remain as representative of a larger whole, whether it's a tribe or a family name or a community or Islam that you know you don't want to deviate too far. Then you become something that is uh, unrecognizable and perhaps unattractive or you become something um, unauthentic and then you get tainted as being too Western, so you are rejected by your home audience and you are not accepted abroad because it seems uh, too close to the same themes that are happening uh, in the West and not uh, sticking to mm. some original Orientalist theme. But um, I was listening to what you and Rose were saying about Iran and you know I think the same problems uh, repeat themselves in on this side of uh, the Gulf, uh, especially when you were talking about homosexuals. Uh, Ahmadinejad uh, made a very interesting and controversial statement to the students in Colombia in 2007 when he said there are no homosexuals in Iran. And, you know, I mean, this applies to a whole litany of social ills and social taboos on, on both sides. And I think in Kuwait especially, I mean, we're trying to patent this test that keeps homosexuals out of Kuwait. This is a, an original feature that we have here. And uh, I think the idea that we can't be honest about our uh, social situations for moral reasons or for, you know, reasons of shame or just pure uh, public denial of a certain crisis or a certain issue uh, limits how much uh, artistic freedom or academic freedom or, you know, the, I think the definition of freedom is, is also part of this uh, censorship issue. Mm. You know, we have uh, a certain political wave coming through the region and everybody is talking in the name of freedom, right? But does that freedom apply to art? Does it apply to your choices in your personal life? Does it apply to uh, expression that is not uh, mainstream or that may or may not be religiously acceptable? 
that is also ideas that we have to consider um, trying to find our way between conformity and censorship. And we'll, we'll, we certainly know that um, we're not as uh, individualistic in the way that we live. So our definition of freedom is very much bound to um, the people that we are going to live with, our tribes as, or our kins, as you say. Um, but then at the same time, we find that, um, I mean, I, I found that, for example, in my own work, that when I use the chador, the chador, uh, as chador art has become a pejorative in Iran. Uh, it's a, really a bad word. If you've worked with the chador, you might as well just go jump off a cliff now. And um, it's because the chador is such a marker um, in your world, um, but it needed to be worked with because it was a marker. But trying to explain that to people that actually, because it's a marker, you need to work with it, but still takes you to a place where they say to you, well, you know, you've made it look pretty in my case, or, you know, you're using it because you're appealing to the West, which I wonder if um, your art, because you specifically use the abaya, is it, it is the abaya, uh, of the Saudi woman, have you been um, accused of appealing to the Western sense of voyeurism about the Saudi woman because you used it in your art? Um, I don't use the abaya in my art at all. Uh, it appears in mm -hmm. certain circumstances, but it's absolutely not the focus. Um, what annoys a lot of people uh, is that uh, most of the themes that I focus on are about women's rights. And, um, and every time somebody talks about women's rights, uh, because especially this period of time where um, women's driving movement has been on everybody's uh, tongue, let's say, that if you mention it to, uh, for example, my younger brothers, they're like, oh my God, not again, <laughs> women's rights. And, and this is a subject that a lot of people say, enough of this, enough of it from Saudi. But in reality, uh, the situation of women hasn't changed. Um, my life hasn't changed. Uh, and the art that I produce is a reflection of my feelings and my life. So as soon as uh, my situation changes as a woman within my country, my art will probably change significantly. Mm -hmm. But right now, that's what's going to be coming out of me. Uh, that said, it's very strange that um, uh, you would think that my art would contain uh, abaya. And this is something mm. that needs to be addressed, especially the stereotypical <laughs> um, themes that are expected from Saudi Arabian artists. Yeah. Or yeah. artists of any country. That yeah. You come from this country, you must be doing chador. You're coming from this country. Can I open a parenthesis? Of course, please. Uh, I remember very well when Shirin Ishat uh, went first, uh, you know, she lived, uh, mo most of you probably know her as an artist uh, who lives in New York. Uh, she lived most of her life in New York, uh, t uh, almost uh, two-thirds of her life in New York. When she first went to Iran, she discovered that uh, opposition, black, white, man, woman, and did the, this series called Woman of Allah with the, with the veiled woman and the writings of Farouk Farouk Zad uh, on the faces. Uh, Farouk Farouk Zad being a poetess who died in the 60s. Anyhow, uh, when she did that work, I remember very clearly in Iran, everybody hated it. They said, what is this? Chador, we have, every day we see chadors, every day we see calligraphy. How comes this be such a success in the West uh, while it's such a boring uh, subject that we see on daily basis? And what they couldn't capture is that in the West, that aesthetics uh, was not yet captured. Because people were so used to it, they didn't see maybe that that was something outstanding image that was coming through. Uh, of course, even today, nobody knows what was the work of Shirin Nishat before that series. Uh, even today, she still is doing uh, films and uh, works that are related to the issues of Iran, about the women not being able to sing in the public, in turbulent, for example. The separation is always black, white, men, women, text, non-text, silent, and so on. So all her work so far, till very recently, I saw a video that she did that was commissioned by Christian Dior. I didn't like it because there was this horrible actress, Natalie uh, Portman, in it. Mm. And I thought she was stiff like anything. And I couldn't understand. I asked her in public, I said, why did you use that bad actress? Uh, she was a bit, no, she's a very nice person. I said, no, she's a Zionist. And now she, so she told me that it was a commission by Dior. 
so you know, you never know what, what are the images that you're using. You can be very outside your country and that is what attracts you. That is the aesthetic that you want to explore. The same thing happened with uh, Daryush Khonji, who's a great cameraman. Uh, he has done wonderful cinematography for many films. And when he went to Iran for the first, I think almost the last time, uh, 10 years ago, he said, Rose, I'm very embarrassed to tell you that these women look beautiful with their chador. You know, this is an aesthetic that I haven't seen. There are landscapes and uh, places that I would have liked to film and show them because I haven't seen in any of the Iranian films. Because the Iranians, I presume, when you're used to something, you don't see the difference anymore. So there is this, this, this side that many Iranians use each other to cater for the West mm. and others not using it in order to be, you know, like the West or themselves or... Yeah. But it is, it, is, it is an issue. It is, do you find the language that speaks to others, that makes it beautiful, that opens a new door or not? But it's interesting for me that you say, um, um, it's, uh, what is Shirin Nashad's work before Women of Allah? What is Shirin Nashad's work this before is, the Chador? The and when you say this was uh, not a recognized emblem, I think it was because um, the media were creating that emblem. It was very much the shorthand for Iran. So I think the ground was very much there. And that's probably why it was uh, seen as using the same codes. And maybe that was where the criticism was possibly coming from. Um, um, with Khonji, but what you were saying, I also find it amazing that maybe George can also help me out on this. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I certainly have, that working with the Western media, they found the chador sexy. It was an erotic thing. I've experienced, uh, you know, uh, women in chador being interviewed who were like this, and the reporter would come out and say, cool, she was sexy. And you'd think, there is something wrong here. This is, you know, what, well, it's supposed you can to be, be sexy in Chador. <laughs> I'm I, taking I mean, the conversation to the Chador because I can't help myself. <laughs> but please help me out, Alanud. I mean, there must be some kind of, you know. Um, I love those black abayas. I'm sorry, in the Gulf, I think it's very Do feminine. You? It's very beautiful. What is not good is when they oblige you to wear it. Exactly. But if it's your choice, I think it's it's a very major difference between when you wear that because it's your choice and when they force you to wear it, which is no longer... Which becomes uh, a, exactly a censorship and a conformity through dress. I don't know. I mean, here in the Gulf, they find them sexy as well. They write reams and reams of poetry yeah. on them. But I think it's always, uh, you know, the lure of the mysterious. And men always want what they can't have. So if you cover your face, they want your face. If you cover your ankle, they want your ankle. So yeah. I think it's also <laughs> a part of that. And, you know, I think it really ties into this idea of censorship as well, right? Because what is censored is also changing. You know, what was a crisis before is no longer an important thing today. I remember before, if, if you were going to, for example, speak to a boy on the phone, it was a big taboo. Mm. But now people talk to anonymous strangers on the internet. So yeah. it's, it's no longer an issue. Yeah. But uh, in, in the... Um, in the 60s, the movies, uh, they had kissing scenes in the mm. Arab world. Now, forget it. You can't yeah. show somebody, you can show somebody being killed, sure, but yeah. a kiss? No. So there's this fluid lines of what freedom is and how we interpret it. That's interesting. Because um, the other thing, again, um, that um, fascinates me is also, th there is obviously this need for all of us to show how we are in a more real way, for artists or journalists. But we also all have different ideas of how this is done. For example, at the moment there is this new wave in Iran for, through Facebook, etc., for people to show ordinary Iran. And ordinary Iran means showing girls without their hijab. But it's still the girls. You know, if it's girls with the chador, and then it's the girls without the chador. And with news, certainly, it's uh, a case of how much can you reveal of your subject. Is it better to keep them veiled, to use the metaphor, or to actually reveal them because you're, the rules of journalism, as you were saying, absolute facts, uh, the power of, what was it you said? The power of, uh, uh, the pow power? Speaking truth to power. Truth to power. So how can that be done with, like you were saying, what happens to the people you leave behind? Where do you draw the line? How do you know where to stop in order not to harm the people who are collaborating with you? It's a very dangerous thing. And you know, the most, the most powerful w weapon of censorship is self-censorship. 
and um, mm. you know that's uh, it's a decision that you know you can't have a blank rule about. You have to take on a case by case basis. But um, really, in, in art and in journalism, um, truth is the most is the most powerful uh, element that you can bring to your work, and to shackle yourself with censorship, to shackle yourself not to say something, is death. And you have to be fearless. You have to be physically fearless. You have to be uh, emotionally fearless as well. And uh, even more so as an artist. Um, because you don't have the protections that, say, someone belonging to a news organization has. Yeah. And because you do have an extended family to think about and all that, that sort of thing. But. Um, I think we all do what we do because we're driven to, to it. We're compelled to do it. We, we can't live otherwise. Mm. And this, is, um, this extends to the artist, as George said, that you have to be fearless. Have you had to be fearless? I'm fearless. I feel fear. <laughs> <laughs> you come across Actually, as fearless. Actually, I had a conversation uh, yesterday with somebody that um, uh, if you don't feel fear when you're working, that means you're not doing such a good job. Mm. So as long as you have that gut wrench feeling, you're on the right path. Yeah. Once you don't feel that, you're, you're going the wrong way. But there's also so often, it's uh, the case of you know, practicalities. Artists have to eat, journalists have to you know, take, uh, put food on the table. And um, with photojournalism in Iran, certainly, it, it, it flourished um, about uh, 15 years ago because there was dollars to be earned from foreign media and the same also happened with art when the market suddenly I mean you were doing this way before Christie's knew where Iran was on the map and um, um, it was a possibly a more authentic time when you were exploring new ground for artists and seeing them in their raw form um, but then the market came in and it really created a sort of a maelstrom of situations going on that meant that there was art being produced for a particular market. Um, this is the thing that then creates the, so the, the charge of exoticness at home about people who do well outside. And this is the one that I have a bit of a problem about. Where, it, where, is the, where are the boundaries? How do we then censor the artist in terms of maybe they do want to do something exotic? I mean, not to be orientalist, does it mean you have to stop being oriental? OK, um, maybe you can help me with this as well, Rose, because I, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and I think it's, it's charming the way that the GCC region has recently really embraced art and you know, followed in the footsteps of places like India and China, where they've abandoned sort of collecting more traditional art and calligraphy and daggers and carpets, etc., to try and embrace this modern art movement. And uh, m my friend, who is a, a wannabe artist, an artist in development, uh, you know, said that for her art is an escape. She doesn't have to be perfect when she's drawing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a joyful journey for her. But I would have thought that for more, you know, most artists, it's really painful to put out your creative self and have people shred it with their opinions and their criticisms. And that got me thinking that we, we may have a problem, you know, establishing a, a standard here. There's this sort of French attitude to embracing anything creative, whether it's good or it's mediocre or, you know, just the fact that we're creating is, is a celebration. So I think as we develop our own aesthetic standards, and there are many artists here from Kuwait with us today who might be able to tell us, you know, this, this struggle between censorship and conformity and establishing what is good art is, is also something that we are struggling with, with or without the, the Western mirror or trying to impress an audience even outside of ourselves. Yeah. Um, definitely. I, th I think when you talked about the market, how it changed and affected, I, I think I answered it last, yesterday. 
that it, it cannot change a good artist. The market will not. Of course, some are. For example, everybody knows the Farhad Mushiri. And if it, it's true that the success, the financial success, the market success of his work uh, took, took him in another direction. They call him the Jeff Koons of Iran and the work. But I think still, even his work is still good because he was always a good artist. I mean, if he wants to make money, Sahtain Albu and in Nushajun, what can we say? Let, why shouldn't he make money? When I met him, he was 40, he didn't have anything. You know, he had a, not a second hand, fourth hand car. Uh, it's, uh, you know, why shouldn't an artist make money? I think I'm, I'm all for it. What they should keep is the quality of the work. Now, of course, now lots of people he doesn't appeal to, but he appeals to others, hmm. and people move on. But we also uh, had the situation about uh, eight years ago in Iran that sort of uh, portrait artists started writing things on their canvases, just suddenly because any kind of writing, yeah, uh, sure. which I always found fascinating, because uh, I always had this uh, notion that these uh, terribly urbane intellectual types who are sort of a bit lefty and would go and see our kind of art, would go to a museum and look at some calligraphy and they didn't know what it was saying. It could have been some obscenity about their mother. But uh, they loved it because it was the writing. True, and true. I happened. mean, it's attractive. Arabic calligraphy is attractive. Persian calligraphy is attractive. So a lot of people are finding in calligraphy what they should have found uh, many years ago in all the Islamic calligraphy for centuries. And with the, the more innovative people like Zender Rudi, like Njama mm -hmm. in Tunis, we saw two, two wonderful young uh, artists this morning here who are taking it every time further and further. There, there are steps in, even in calligraphy that goes beyond the, beyond the traditional and beyond the, the already known. And I think this is the exciting part of it, is to discover in what media, in what form, in what shape, in what concept things go further. Uh, but, but it, became uh, but it is true that there is an exotic, but there is an ignorance also. Mm. We have to educate the West. We have mm -hmm. to educate ourselves, but also we have to educate the West. And that's why uh, I think we, it's fantastic if we publish, if we record, if we archive. Uh, and I'm happy that you're archiving this, uh, this, this event, because one day you will say, oh, 20 years mm. ago, we had that meeting at that conversation, and since then, everything has evolved. And that's the key, I think, that it's uh, not relying so much on the Western outlets and having creating more and more regional outlets. Um, uh, Worldwide, aren't they? We are no yeah. longer a country. We are everywhere. The world is our territory. I mean, frankly, what she's doing is not for Saudis or for women, or it's for everybody. When, when I saw that issue, it was the issue of uh, women driving, women traveling, uh, and it can apply to many, not only many countries, but it can apply to, uh, uh, to my ma mother or grandmother or grandpa great grandparents. So you either apply it in time or in space, but the, the issues are valid, and it's how you express them that uh, brings a new door, a new opening, and a new discussions. That is fantastic. Mm. And uh, with something like, um, sort of, for example, like I, I always find the role of uh, the market houses when they came to the region a little bit uh, destructive, personally. I mean, constructive in a sense, but um, the way that they acted as galleries as opposed to secondhand shops, which they're supposed to be, uh, was a little bit uh, sad. And it, that, it did harm some artists in Iran, because they took their prices so far up that they couldn't sell in Iran anymore. But, with but they harmed themselves. By allowing they, it. They harmed themselves by allowing it also. Uh, when every artist goes directly to the auction house and gives it. But you know now the, the, the territory between uh, charity auctions, galleries, uh, foundations, uh, uh, even auction houses now, Sotheby's and Christie's are opening galleries in London. So they are no longer auction houses, but they are galleries, so they can buy from the auction houses cheap and then put it. You know, it's very, all these uh, frontiers are very, very flu, mm. and they are constantly changing. The market is changing them, because if there is money to be made, yeah. they would change it. So it's, uh, you know, everybody has to be careful. If they want to make quick money and disappear, lots of people did that. Yeah. Uh, it's, their, we, it's their choice. We are seeing a development in the news world uh, with the establishment of uh, somewhere like Al Jazeera. Certainly in documentary, um, we're getting more of a regional voice and a, a different kind of outlook. Um, have you found that your work has uh, become easier, your expression, your creative expression has become easier because now there is a place like Al Jazeera? as opposed to having to sell the same film maybe to CNN or BBC? 
Absolutely, absolutely. This work wouldn't have sold to those, uh, to those outlets. And for years, I worked with the New York Times and um, the Associated Press and Time and Newsweek. And I felt as though, you know, rather than, uh, than help, helping further understanding, I was really throwing gasoline on the fire of disinformation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with a local news outlet, I mean, it's, it's strange to call Al Jazeera local, but mm. uh, with a regional news outlet like Al Jazeera, at least the people that you're speaking with come from a perspective which is understandable to me. I don't have to I explain to them that Gaza is enslaved. I don't have to explain to them that there is an occupation in Palestine or that even that there is a place called Palestine. Mm -hmm. Our starting point is the same. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and there's and all the panelists here for your expertise. But um, what I'm getting out of this particular panel is that obviously there's limitations, and uh, through it, we actually find where our own limitations are. And sometimes those limitations seem to push us into a different direction, and hopefully that would be a more creative direction. And uh, thank you for all of you listening. Thank you all. Thank you.